gentlemen. Welcome, Welcome to the Block Crunch Podcast, the go-to podcast for investors and builders in crypto. And before we get started, just a reminder for you guys out there, the Block Crunch Podcast is intended for informational purposes only. Neither the host nor its guests are licensed financial advisors, and nothing discussed should be construed as financial advice. Views held by Block Crunch's guests are their own, and sponsorship messages do not constitute financial advice or endorsement. With that out of the way, let's jump right in. Now, before we get started with today's episode, I've got some great news for you. Now, a lot of you have been asking for how I analyze projects that I bring on the show. That's why I decided to create Blockcrunch VIP to share with you all the heavy research that goes on behind the scenes. Now, every week or so, our team prepares an in-depth research memo with things like sector analysis, technical concepts made simple, in-depth competitor breakdown, and even interactive models so you can learn about the most important projects before they become important. And our team is putting in hours every week scouring Discord, Twitter, forums, and blogs to help you get an edge in crypto and understand the latest projects and themes at the deepest levels that goes way beyond just an interview. Now, in addition, we'll also host exclusive AMAs with myself to answer any of your questions. So all of these are only available to Blockcrunch VIP subscribers. And the good news is that while our interviews will always be free, the VIP tier costs less than one coffee a day. So head on over to theblockfringe.com slash VIP or click the link in the show notes below to sign up. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Block Crunch podcast. Now, this week, we have a very, very special episode that's, I think, a few years in the making because I've known the guest for a few years uh, throughout his two previous roles. And this guest is Afi Fellman. He's a veteran trader in crypto. So he recently, well, actually, not too recently, left uh, Block Block Tower Capital as the head of trading to join a traditional asset manager, Golden Tree, which is almost a $50 billion asset manager to help with the crypto efforts. Now, since then, he's disclosed an investment into Sushi around the time that Sushi announced they elected a new CEO. And there's a new uh, few stories around that that we're going to talk about later as well. But I think this is a huge news and really underappreciated how significant it is for an investor of Golden Tree's pedigree and caliber to not just be dabbling, but actively investing and participating in crypto. So I'm really, really excited to finally have Avi on the show. Um, So welcome to the show, man. Jason, thanks for having me. You're right. It has been years in the making. I actually, I remember our first phone call when we first got introduced to each other back in 2019 at this point. Yeah. I think you were, you you were at Wave, right? At the time. Yep. Yep. It was a, it was a uh, yeah, that, I guess it was like mid or early 2019. That that was such a long time ago. It's crazy how many things have changed. Back then, people didn't even say the word DeFi. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. People were calling it like OpenFi. Um, I guess that's yeah. a pretty good segue for you to kind of maybe give us a little background about how you tumbled into this world of institutional finance, dabbling into crypto or participating actively in crypto. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, you know, I, I've only ever really done crypto. So graduated in 2017 from university and then just went into crypto full time uh, as an investor and trader. And so I, uh, my, my most recent role was at Block Tower Capital, where I was a co-PM of the flagship fund alongside Ari Paul. And you know, we, we ran that fund together uh, you know, for, for, for a while. And obviously, it was a great and amazing seat. And during that time, the crypto market changed dramatically. So it went from effectively being a backwater that was made fun of by everybody in traditional finance, quote unquote, to being a place that everybody in traditional finance was trying to get into and try to understand. Uh, I remember back when I first joined Block Tower, there was a there was a phrase that would get thrown around all the time, which was reputational risk. And you don't really hear that anymore. People used to talk about it all the time in 2019 and even 2020. Well, the reason that crypto is not bigger is because there's a lot of reputational risk for investing in crypto. And you'd sit there and you'd nod your head and you'd go, yeah, there is because it's, you know, could go to zero. Maybe it does. You don't really hear that as much anymore, right? People are really dedicating, you know, resources, really dedicating build outs. I mean, you see it across traditional financial institutions now where they look at crypto and they realize that, hey, Crypto is the future, and we have to figure out some sort of plan to access the market, to trade the market, to understand the market. And so, you know, I was um, that seat at Block Tower was a great seat, very crypto native. The Block Tower guys, you know, have had traditional backgrounds, but then really came into crypto 2016, 2017, started a great fund. And, you know, it was, it was focused on the crypto native aspects of investing and, and, and trading. 
So, you know, over 2021, near the end, you started to see a lot of these big institutions come into the market. People like Tiger, people like D1, you know, people like KOTU, I guess that was a little bit earlier than, than end of 2021, but you get the point where there were a lot of traditional institutions that were coming in uh, that, you know, were really known more for punting tech stocks. And they just looked at crypto and they said, hey, this is, this is sort of similar, right? So let, 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 me go, let me go start investing in here. The wave before that were all the macro funds that bought, that bought Bitcoin. And so you really had these two sets of, two sets of participants that have come in, you know, you've had these macro guys that, that came in that view Bitcoin as a macro asset, Ethereum as a potentially a macro asset, and then the tech guys that came in a little bit later. And then you got Golden Tree, which is a little bit of an oddball. So Golden Tree is distressed debt, credit, value, you know, deep. <laughs> they, they look at balance sheets, they restructure companies. You know, we, we really look to do deep fundamental research on the companies that we invest in on the, on the traditional side. And a lot of the time, if you look at what our holdings are, it's debt. It's not, it's not equity. You know, obviously we, you know, we, we do both, but that's, that's really been the core of it. And so when they called me up and they said, we're starting a crypto business, I almost laughed. I was like, that, that makes absolutely no sense. Why would you guys be starting a crypto business? What do you, what do you, what do you know about crypto? And as it turns out a lot, so mm. they had actually added Bitcoin to their balance sheet on their management company level in 2021 before it ripped and then announced it at the top, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is pretty funny. Um, but, you know, they, uh, you know, they, they came in early and, and there's really, you know, one guy that was, that was leading the effort, this guy named Joe, Joe Nager, who's my partner in the subsidiary that we spun out called Golden Chain, which is just focused on crypto. And he's been in crypto longer than I have. He's been in crypto since 2014, uh, you know, started mining Bitcoin in his basement. And the guy, is just an extremely passionate uh, about the industry just across the board loves it and so i got on the phone with him and he explained to me that golden tree was going to do it right they weren't going to be afraid of the crypto market in, in a way that i think a lot of traditional institutions are that we're trading DeFi, we're on all exchanges that you could possibly think of wow. we're leading activist plays in things like sushi swap which if you know the history, that might shock you because guess what? There were no VCs in that. Mm. There's a pure grassroots crypto native project. You know, we're, we're out there, we're gonna be releasing over the, in the next week, a 35 page report, a technical report on, on ZK rollups. So we're, we're, pretty, we're pretty in the weeds now. You know, I think uh, you, can, you can almost think of us as a, as a crypto native shop that exists within a traditional umbrella. And really it comes from the top. It comes from Steve, who's our CIO, looking at crypto and going, hey, this is here to stay, you know, from, from a value perspective. I actually remember, as a fun, fun little anecdote. So when I was first talking with Steve uh, in an interview, you know, I, I asked him one question, which was, what hap how do you feel about crypto if it goes down 50%, if it goes down 70%, if it goes down 90%? He goes, well, I, I love it. I'm a distressed investor. If something of value goes down, I like it better, not worse. It's like, okay, it's a good answer, right? That, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty cool. You, you, don't, you don't hear that a lot from, uh, for, from people running $50 billion hedge funds, folks. Mm -hmm. that so, you know, it's, it, it, it's, cool. It, it's cool to be in this position. I, you know, I really feel fortunate to be able to lead, um, you know, gold, Golden Tree and on the digital asset side, crypto, crypto side. God, they've got me saying digital asset, crypto, <laughs> and crypto side. Um, you know, really, really doing crypto native stuff uh, and, and sort of the, the, the way that I think about it is dragging, you know, not, you know, not, not kicking and screaming, actually walking hand in hand with a traditional financial institution into, into crypto. And that, that, that's been, that's been pretty fun. I think that that's really incredible. And I remember when you first announced that you were joining Golden Tree, uh, a lot of folks in our circles were like, huh, you're the only person going into back in the traditional finance, right? Everyone else is either doing like prop or joining crypto native firms. And I think actually in, in hindsight, this was such a strategic move as well, because it only makes sense if crypto takes off for more institutions, not, not fewer institutions to come in. And I guess on that note, right, do you think that as more funds, as more sophisticated funds like Golden Tree uh, comes in, are we going to see a move away from this kind of very retail driven market cycles where it's all narrative driven, it's a lot of memes into something more kind of serious, maybe something that resembles more like actually tech equities? 
and are we going to get like consensus around valuation models and stuff like that? Or is that still going to, you know, is it still going to be a retail playground? Oh, I, I think 100% it's going to become less retail and it's the market's going to become a lot smarter. So that was one of the reasons that I, you know, in, in my head sitting there thinking, hey, where do I think the market is going to go? Well, the market's probably going to do what every other market in the history of markets have, has done and become smarter and more efficient over time. And so it's going to become less of an insider's game. And I think, you know, crypto has very much so been, if, if you get crypto, then you get crypto and there's a massive barrier to entry to get in. There's a lot of knowledge that's locked away that you can only get through experience in crypto. I think that's beginning to change actually. And, and, and realistically, thanks to people like you, you know, I got your Cosmos 2.0 report, right? That, <laughs> that kind of stuff didn't exist two years ago. There's, you know, how are you going to get everything that you needed to know about NASA two years ago? You know, there's high quality research now. Uh, there, there, there are people that are willing to share. So the, the initial barrier to entry is becoming lower. The, the knowledge-based barrier to entry is becoming lower. So what that means is that the competition is going to get harder and harder and harder and harder, right? And what you're going to, what you're going to see is you're going to see uh, what was a crazy retail-driven market still maintain a lot of aspects of that, but just become a little bit more efficient over time, right? And I think you can actually see this if you look at uh, you know, the crypto market and you look at the best performers of the last year and the worst performers over the last year, what assets have been doing a good job, you know, with their BD, with actually advancing tech, with attracting users, with, with scoring partnerships, which ones haven't, how have their valuations changed? Like if you look at L1s as an example of this, in 2021, the game was whatever L1 was paying their customer or paying their users the most to come on board were the ones that would do the best for that moment of time. Over the last year, basically since that ecosystem fund thing has stopped working and people have stopped being paid to go move over to L1s, if you rank the L1s in terms of performance, you're actually going to notice that the ones near the top have the most usage over the last year. And the ones mm -hmm. near the bottom have some of the least. You know, you know, if you look at, you know, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, on the on the long side, which is you know Matic has been actually a pretty decent performer over the over the last ten months relative to the rest of the L1 space, and they've done a good job onboarding people and scoring Starbucks and Facebook and all these other guys, right? And so I think what you're seeing is you know you, you're you're seeing a bit of uh, what I what I call you know relative value play out in crypto, and that to me tells me that people are actually doing their research. They're actually going in there and they're, and they're stock picking. And so the ones that people don't want to pick are doing badly and the ones that people want to pick are doing well, right? Um, and I think that dynamic is going to persist. I think almost tautologically, there have to be retail bubbles in crypto just because of the ease of, act, you know, the ease of access, uh, the crazy volatility, the crazy leverage. All of that, you know, like the the ability to go punt 100x on something that has a that has a hundred vol, right? I think that's always going to draw that's going to draw retail. But I think over time it becomes a little bit more efficient. Um, and you know, I'm speaking the liquid market specifically right now. It becomes a little bit a little bit more efficient. Um, and you know, that's one of the reasons that I think you're going to see traditional funds move in is because the barrier to entry is becoming lower, and you can take similar skill sets and apply it to crypto and you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And the reason it's not a bad thing is because these, these systems are built to be resilient. That's the whole point is that they're, they're built, you know, to, to not be, to not be co-opted, to have some level of, of resilience against, uh, you know, against corporations. And I think pe pe when people think about institutions coming in, sometimes they have that angle. And I, I just don't necessarily think that's, that's true. If, if it was true, then the system wasn't built particularly well in the first place. Um, so, you know, my, 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 my view on this is it's just going to make the, the market smarter. And that, that's the direction that we're going in. I think this is, this is music to my ears because I, I think I'm more of a research guy or analyst rather than a trader. Whereas in the past few cycles, there are times when I felt like an idiot when we were building DCFs and trying to, you know, model out the valuations for these tokens. And then some random dog coin would just run 100x and outperform everyone else with no reason. But I think that probably is going away. So I think on that same note, right, in terms of opportunities, now we're in a pretty strange time in the market where we have 
a ton of VC funds. I think in, in this year alone, we have like 400 VC funds uh, raise $120 billion pouring into private markets. So my opinion is that I feel like private markets are kind of crowded out. But at the same time, you know, on the algo trading side, you have sophisticated guys like Citadel. On the farming side, you have like Alameda. On the directional side, um, you have you guys coming in. So wh- where is the opportunity now? Like wh- where where do you see there being a blue ocean in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of investment strategy? Oh, man, I, I got to say, I, I still love the liquid markets. There's so much opportunity. And that's, you know, that, that's, that's where I focus. That's where Gold, Golden Tree is, is, is focused right now, although we've done a lot of VC as well. Um, but uh, I, I think what, you, what you'll find is that <laughs> there, there are a lot of structural reasons why people went to VC. Namely, it's hard to do liquid. Like you don't, you, if you're in VC, you don't have to price things every day, mm. right? Okay. If you're in liquid, you do. Mm. Uh, that's a very simple example, but honestly, a huge roadblock because people are like, where do I go price? How do I price this thing that I bought on Uniswap, right? Like, like, do I, like, how do I report a nav on this thing, right? Um, it's, that sounds very simple to people in crypto, very difficult for traditional institutions and also difficult for hedge funds in general. Like if you're just a dude that's starting a hedge fund and you want to do that in a professional way, that actually costs you a decent amount of money. Um, so it's like a lot easier to start. A, it's, a, it's a lot easier to start a small VC fund and a big VC fund, right? Um, so that's that's one reason. The other is, uh, you know, there there are a lot of regulatory issues still for people interacting with tokens. So everybody that interacts with a token that buys something takes on some level of risk that at some point in the future that thing is you know deemed a security or whatnot, right? Uh, and I think uh, there's they're just different levels of risk tolerance. And there are a lot of institutions and a lot of just general people don't, they don't want to play in the liquid token game because they're like, okay, I just don't want to deal with that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to either directly just invest in equity, call it such, or we're going to, you know, get these SAFTs and then we'll get the tokens, but you know, we're not going to trade them, right? We're not going to, you know, actively be trading these things. They were just issued to us and, you know, we'll mark them here and, you know, if we'll distribute them to our LPs or maybe we'll sell them eventually on a plan, right? It's a little bit easier to manage uh, than, than than actively trading, um, and so you know I think I think what you find is that there are just a lot of structural reasons why money has flowed to VC funds. It's it's also because allocators, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people they don't necessarily want to be looking at marks daily or or, or monthly. They also uh, you know they they want to they want to invest in the moonshots, and realistically, VC is where you get the moonshots, right? A lot of people that invest invest in crypto, they they close their eyes and they say, "Okay, I'm going to put one one of my hundred dollars in here, and hopefully it goes to 100." Right? And that's that's genuinely how pension funds, endowments, all these guys are investing in crypto. Right? It's their moonshot, and that's not a bad thing. You you always want moonshots, but you know if you're going to be investing in a in a moonshot, you know sometimes you want to you want to invest in a VC. With all of that said, because of all of the capital that has just gone to VC, you're seeing some pretty insane valuations. Which I think is going to drive down the re- returns of VC to make them to make liquid funds actually look pretty attractive, like actually very attractive relative to VC funds at this point, because there are things on the liquid market that are trading effectively do the same thing as things in the you know, private market that we're trading at much lower valuations. And then the moment the things that are private go live on the liquid markets, they immediately crater to the valuation of the thing that's on the liquid market. Mm. And so, like, you know, the, like there there were a lot of rounds that were closed in May of this year. But by the time the token has come out, it's like, well, now it's trading like ninety percent down already, right? From from where that from where that round from where that round closed. And you know, I think one thing to remember about crypto is just all, all like almost everything in crypto becomes liquid in like eighteen months. So you're gonna get you you're gonna need to understand how liquid markets work if if you're gonna be if you're gonna be investing. So I think you know, there's just been a flood of a flood of capital into into VC, which to me has made it a lot less attractive. I think somebody told me a funny anecdote, which is, you know, this, this, was, a, this was a fund that was investing in both fintech and uh, crypto. And they're like the first time founder in crypto that is pre-product can currently get done at 15 to 20 mil. <laughs> a second time founder that with a successful exit can, in fintech can get done pre-product at five to 10. It's crazy. And you're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Yeah, it's, right. crazy, man. it's um, it it's 
it's funny as well because I feel like two, three years ago, VC was like the intellectuals game in crypto, whereas liquid markets were seen as you know just punting and gambling. And you know, in VC, you do a lot of research in the tech side. But now I feel like the the smart person's game, or at least the, the fun game, is the liquid markets. It's there's a lot more intricate pieces you have to understand. You actually need to understand what you're trading as well. Um, whereas for VCs, it's a lot. It it strikes me as a lot of asset gathering. People just trying to raise as big funds as possible and just like spray everywhere, which is um, well. I mean, this is I'm not I'm not here to you know disparage anybody or, or say anything, but that's you know that that's how the the normal financial markets work too. That the hedge funds are the ones doing the complicated stuff, and the VCs are the ones shaking hands. Right? That's not <laughs> but like, Spicy. That, like that. You know, but it's just reverting. It's reverting to the natural state of the world. Mm-hmm. I like that. I like that. It, Let's, let's actually zoom in a little bit now because I've yeah. always wanted to talk to you about this, uh, which is your investment strategy because you, you've looked at so many markets. You've been part of so many different um, setups as well, different shops as well. Um, so when you kind of look at the types of bets you make, it seems like you're thinking both in the very short term in terms of trading, but also you, you do things like sushi, which we'll talk about later, which seems like a more kind of long term or value or even like a venture type position, but built in a liquid market. So how do you think about how do you first of all how do you categorize the different types of bets you make yeah so you know the the one thing that i'll say about the trading is that trade trading often leaves you too short term focused and you need you need long term capital you need long term thinkers and you need people who are able to invest for the long term in this market for two reasons one it's because those are the pe- people that actually drive the market forward that find the interesting ideas that bet on teams that wait three years and support them through. And then, you know, you have, you have great outcomes. Those are the people that are actually driving forward the space. Uh, and two is because, you know, I, I think, I think if you, if you don't invest from a fundamental perspective, you personally are just going to end up losing out. Right. If, if you're constantly trading, basically everybody that I know that's a pure trader, they get, they get destroyed by people that just buy and hold <laughs> and the stuff that they've like really, you know, like really, really believe in. Um, you know, the, the best people, the most successful people that I've seen, uh, and this is, you know, the strategy that I try to emulate, and this is what I've you know thought about for a very long time, are the people who can do both. Hmm. Are the people who can do the deep fundamental research, like really find assets that they believe in, and basically work to just accumulate those assets over time through active trading, right? Hmm. It's like, you have these two, you know, and, and this is just how I personally approach the market. I just have, I have these two buckets. I have my fundamental value. This is all the stuff that I've researched that, that I really believe in that I'm just going to try to hold for two to three years. Maybe it's some VC, maybe it's some liquid market. And then I have my trading capital. And there's so many inefficiencies in the market. There's so much crazy stuff that you can do day over day. I mean, like Doge, for example, like the moment that it was reported that Elon was going to close, it had to be longer. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And it didn't move for like a day. And then mm. it went up 30%. Mm. I mean, you know, it went up, went up with ETH a little bit, but then it outperformed a lot more over like today and yesterday. And you just look at those things and you go, that's, that's just an inefficiency. And, you know, that, that's like a funny one. There are all sorts of other, you know, other, other ones that, that, that we look at, but you know, then you, you basically, you trade actively, you manage your exposure, uh, you know, we also trade on a macro basis because Golden Tree has you know pretty strong background in macro trading. Right. You know, so we, we you know we we have like macro overlays on our on our portfolios, and we say, okay, you know, we don't we want we want to be lower risk now and higher risk now. And generally, you know, if if you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily suggest that everybody do this, but that that is an approach, right? You just reduce risk when things are frothy and increase risk when things aren't. Um, so, for example, when something like you know, when a when a when a video game is trading at forty billion, you might want to take some chips off the table. Um, just uh, you know, like what you want to do is 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 really actively trade, take that PL, shovel it to long term fundamental positions. And then over time, I think you end up with a better result, kind of on both ends. Hey guys, I'm really excited to tell you more about one of my favorite products in crypto right now, DYDX. This is a team I've known since 2018, and they've built one of the best exchange venues out there that also happens to be decentralized and mobile friendly. Now listen until the end because there's an opportunity for savvy traders out there as well. 
And here are just a few reasons why I like UIDX over other exchanges. First, it's very liquid. It processes two to $3 billion every day in volume and has 35 perpetual swaps as of this recording, which means you can trade things like Ethereum, Bitcoin, Doge, Solana, and most of the most popular assets with up to 20X leverage in the venue today. Now, second, it's also extremely cheap. And if you're down bad from the bear market, you don't have to worry about gas fees at all because there is no gas fee on Starkware Layer 2 where DYDX is built on. Now, that brings me to my next point as well. It's incredibly fast. Unlike other Layer 2 and high-speed DEXs, you don't actually have to wait to withdraw your assets anymore. And as an additional point, by using Starkware, DYDX also provides users with increased security and privacy. And my personal favorite feature is the cross-margin feature, which means I can seed one account with USDC and trade across multiple markets from there without needing to start sub-accounts because I really hate managing so many different sub-accounts. And their iOS mobile app is also live right now, and it's amazing because it's compatible with MetaMask, Coinbase Wallet, Coin98, Huobi Wallet, and a lot of the most popular mobile wallets out there. And it's available for people outside of the US or sanctioned countries today. And one last thing, one exciting opportunity is their competitions. The most recent tier in the $10,000 equity tier have won over $95,000 in rewards. And you can get started with as low as $500 in equity to compete for prizes. So if you're already trading, might as well get paid to do it. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, I highly recommend that you head on over to dydx.exchange to learn more. And I thank them for sponsoring this episode. I, I do like that mix. And I think in reality, it's so hard to achieve because the skill sets required for the two and the temperament required for the two are so different. For for traders, I know they're always looking at, you know, things like open interest, funding raise and all that. They, they, they kind of need to have a very disciplined system to trade. For the longer term folks, it's more about kind of what new ideas are there, uh, what, what gaps are there in the market that we need to build and a lot more kind of research into the actual assets that you have to be buying. Um, so I guess when you kind of straddle between the two, um, how do you pick what inputs to inform um, what type of decisions? Um, and I guess let's start with the short term, short, shorter term trading first. Like what kind of stuff do you look at in trading that you wouldn't care about in fundamental kind of long term stuff? It's a lot of the stuff that you mentioned. I mean, it's the open interests, it's the funding rates, it's uh, futures curve, it's uh, options skew. Uh, you know, we look at we look at macro data a lot. Uh, at Golden Tree specifically to, to help us inform, just because the correlation's been so high uh, over the last over the last eight months. You know, we look at we look at uh, you know technicals in the in the S and P as well. Which, if by the way, pe pe people say, oh, you, you can't trade the S and P. You can, uh, <laughs> you, you just you, you like <laughs> like you you just you just need to know what what you're paying attention to. Um, you know, obviously it's super difficult, really, really, really tough market. But I mean, there are guys out there that have been calling this year perfectly the entire time, like Michael Hartnett over at Bank of America. All he does all day is he just goes and he looks at that, how people are positioned and he goes, well, okay, well, because there, nobody knows what the hell is going on. It's just flows and, fun, and there are no fundamentals impacting this market. So I'm just going to go up based off positioning and he's been nailing it all year. Right. So it's like, uh, you know, I, I think I think the the equity markets have become very much so like the crypto markets, unfortunately, instead of the other way around. Uh, you know, you, you see Amazon selling off fifteen percent or twenty percent or whatever it was after hours. Uh, Snapchat was down like twenty five percent after hours. Just like constant constant insanity in these in these markets. You know, what what I look at in in, in the crypto markets really, um, there's so many different ways to trade short term. Right, you can trade based off of a narrative, and so then you have to assess well what makes a narrative strong and what makes a narrative weak. Okay, well maybe you can look at uh, the number of mentions that it has on Twitter, the number of mentions that it has that, that it has on Reddit. How is it growing over time? Right, um, like one thing that I looked at, uh, for example, was with Reddit NFTs. There was a headline that was, oh wow, you know. There are only, you know, there there are two point five million wallets that were activated. There were three, three or three thousand wallets that were being used, and everybody in the comments was going, "Wow, that that sucks!" Like, guess it has no usage. Three thousand wallets, and then you go look, and you're like, "Oh wow, that all happened within the last two weeks, hmm. right?" So two point five million wallets were created, and then a bunch of a bunch of stuff started actually happening. And then you you, you look at that and you go, "Okay, well now I'm starting to see the spark, right?" So maybe I should be doing something here. Right. Um, so a lot, a lot of the the narrative stuff, I think, is is more qualitative than quantitative. But you can bring in some quantitative inputs, and then 
you know, there's, there, there's a lot of opportunity just honestly based off of mar market positioning in crypto, which you can get mostly from OI funding and SKU is like what I, what, I, what I was talking about. And then on the, on the rel val side, on the trading side, I think that there's a tremendous amount of alpha in understanding supply and demand and where it comes from. So for example, you know, you look at something like an optimism and an axi, and they just had tremendous amount of supply that was coming online. And so effectively, you know, for, for optimism for a bit there, you have to make the bet that there was $50 million a month of buy pressure coming into, or actually when it was at two, it was like $200 million of buy pressure coming in a month to keep this thing at $2. You're like, how the heck is that going to happen? Where's $200 million going to come from? That doesn't make any sense. Right. And so, you know, you, you, you start, you start to dig into the actual like flows and supply and demand of these assets. And you go, look, like optimism might be great tech, but you know, our job is not to buy great tech. Our job is to buy great tech at great prices. <laughs> so, you know, that's, uh, that, that's something that I always keep in the back of my mind is you, you need to understand where the supply and demand is coming from and, you know, figuring out supply unlock schedules, figuring out who's positioned for something who isn't. So for example, you look at, you look at something like that. If there were $200 million of shorts, well, guess what? You just found your buyers, but there weren't. So there were no buyers, you know? Mm. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it's stuff like that. Uh, that, that you have to pay attention to and that you have to look at. And, and I think, you know, you, you always have to be very, uh, you always have to be very careful, I'll say in crypto, because there, 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 are, there are a lot of things that can always get you if you're trading actively. Um, and so I definitely wouldn't suggest, you know, uh, um, unless you have a team, it's probably hard unless you're like scalping intraday. And, you know, you, you see people on Twitter and there, there are a bunch of successful people out there on Twitter and, you know, I'm not doubting that they're successful, but it's, you know, it's, you, you got, you got to be really good to be able to do that alone. Mm, yeah, no, I agree. I think over time is going to get harder and harder as well. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So we mentioned a few things here. So a way to quantify narratives, like number of Reddit mentions, we talked about market structure data, like uh, OI option skew. We talk about supply and demand. So those are things that move markets for the trading side. Now, on the long term, what what actually moves prices in crypto in the long term? Is it development? Is it narratives? Is it memes? It's it's a great question. I think uh, I'm I'm kind of gonna say this time is different in a <laughs> sense. So if you, if you look at like 2017 and 2018, nothing made sense. Like things would just pump off of narrative and memes and like what people yeah. thought was like fun and exciting. Uh, you know, drones on the blockchain. <laughs> send it up uh you know and, and then you fast forward you fast forward to 2020 and you get uh you know DeFi, right and DeFi DeFi does really well and it gets it gets a bunch of, it gets a bunch of usage and everybody gets really excited about it and usage actually goes up through 2021 and DeFi is in a bear market against ETH for the whole time mm. you're like what what's going on right um you know with, with the large caps at least right uh and so i think i think what i'm what, what I'm trying to express is that historically, it's really just been about flows and the flavor of the month because it's been kind of difficult to assign real valuations to things uh, because a lot of the stuff that existed was fairly interchangeable. What do I mean by that? Well, your experience using an Avalanche or a Matic or a Near was only slightly different. It wasn't radically different. It was slightly different. You know, and your experience using a sushi swap or Uniswap in 2021 wasn't radically different. It was slightly different. And you fast forward to today, I think that products are actually starting to differentiate themselves, which is going to allow smart investors to come in and pick assets that are actually good on a, you know, you, you assess the team. How competent, is the, how competent is the team that's building it? How competent are the developers? How innovative is the protocol? What is the what does the user experience look like? What is the customer acquisition cost of this thing? Are they getting users because they're paying them, or are they getting users because it's organic? Right? All of the things that you might go and assess a traditional company by, you're going to assess crypto protocols by. You know, a, a slightly different thing is okay. Well, you know, with L ones, right? Like, uh, what types of projects can they can they can they attract? What you know, what what is a dev tooling around the environment to come on and actually go build it? You know, so when you know, one L1 might have really great dev tooling where you can go Google, you know, you can go Google something and there, there's effectively 
answers for what you're trying to build, right? I think that, that's actually one reason, by the way, why Ethereum does so well is these are a lot of resources. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm trying to solve this problem on Ethereum. Like, let me go into the stack overflow and like find an answer. And you can do that with Ethereum and you can't do that with a lot of others. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, I, I think that that's, that's a big aspect to it, but people are going to start to, are going to start to develop these frameworks for how to value, you know, L1s and at protocols at this point are effectively just companies with tokenized equity. Like that's kind of what they are. Um, you know, uh, I, th I think that, I think that DAOs are a very, very powerful tool and, you know, they're, they're a very powerful thing. And it's, but in my mind, it's, it's just a better version of our current corporate structure at the end of like, you can design a better version of our current, cur current corporate structure, which means that, you know, you're going to evaluate them in similar ways. Uh, they're going to be slightly, you know, slightly different ways to evaluate a DAO versus a company, but realistically, you're going to evaluate them in very similar ways. Um, and so, you know, you, you start, you start to do all these things and you start to realize that, uh, because of the increased amount of education, because of the increased amount of smart capital it's allocating, like I just said, retail is likely to follow that smart money in a way that they haven't really before. And what it means is that uh, constructed narratives, like what you had in 2021, just they're not going to hit the same because you're actually going to be able to see a discrepancy in usage and, and, and you know, uptake of these different platforms. Right. When everything is starting kind of at the same level, it's very easy to construct narratives for each random thing. When things start to really show their true colors, it's a little bit harder to construct narratives. Right. So I, th I think uh, I think that's what you're going to see moving forward is, is you know, it's it's always it's always going to exist in a market like this, well, like always. But, you know, I, I think you're just going to see less of it. Hmm. It always comes back to the point about kind of, I guess, increasing sophistication in the market. And And, and speaking of institutional participation. I'd love to kind of talk about Sushi as well, because that is, I think the first time in history, a fund of Golden Tree size and caliber is actively participating in an asset with like no VCs, just completely community bootstrapped. Uh, but before I dive into that, um, you know, obviously after you guys announced the investment, there was a little bit of a drama that came out with the CEO for Sushi, who was accused of, um, let, let's say, impropriety with, with a, uh, with, with a, mammal that is not a human so what exactly happened there can you can you clear the air on that a little bit <laughs> okay well just just so you know the new the new ceo of sushi is uh his name is jared gray and unfortunately he shares a name with somebody who does things like that for a living and so somebody <laughs> decided to comment on one of the posts hey is this the same jared gray I can categorically say no, it is not the same Jared Gray, but the thing went viral <laughs> anyway. Oh uh, I actually God. happen to think that this is probably pretty good for sushi because it's like so obviously false, but it's so obviously hilarious at the same time <laughs> that it's probably just not like good for, for the asset uh, because I think that we're going to be able to do some fun stuff, especially around the stable swap that's being launched. Yeah, and so, I, I know you guys proposed a lot of improvements to the protocol um, re pretty recently. You guys wrote two proposals on the forum. Um, but zooming out a little bit, like, why did you guys get involved in the first place? Like, how, how did you get comfortable with you know, taking part in a completely, I guess, community driven project um, that has like no uh, stamp of approval from like the big, uh, the big players in like VC land? Yeah, I mean, you know, realistically, that's just not something we care about. What we care about is, you know, is, is the team good? Are the engineers good? Are the people good? Is the product good? Right. And what we realized very quickly, you know, I've been involved in Sushi tangentially, at least for you know, basically since the beginning. Uh, you know, I was farming it um, basically day one. And, uh, you know, I was part, part, of, part of the whole drama. And I've always had a little bit of a soft spot for Sushi. You know, watched it over the years, uh, and when I came when I came to Golden Tree, one of the things that I learned is that Golden Tree has been extremely successful at restructuring companies. You know, there there mm -hmm. there are a lot of success stories, uh, and I think we have some of the best you know minds on the street when it comes to turning around companies that have you know what I would call good bones, but the leadership isn't quite there. Uh, and so we've kind of seen the story play out. And I looked at Sushi. You know, one of our one of our analysts, Mark. Who's really, really smart, sharp guy, you know, has, has been talking to the engineering team at Sushi for, for, for quite some time, got to know them very well. I got, you know, I got to know them a bit. Uh, you know, we got to 
really sit down with them and understand where they're where they're coming from what were the problems why were products not being re released why was it why did there seem to be a little bit of stagnation in fighting all of that and we got comfortable with the idea that it was just a lack of leadership at the time and that they really needed a new ceo uh you know and that they really needed you know because engineers are just so talented and a lot of the you know a lot of the guys on the bd side were talented too you know it was just there there was there was a lack of a clear vision for how sushi swap could compete and so what we wanted to do is we wanted to come in there and, and help them with that right because if you look at you know if you look at tvl uh you i think uniswap has 10x more tvl and is valued at 30 times sushi swap no they do you know i think 25 times the volume uh but i think that what that what that told us is that there was room for not just relative growth but for capturing some market share uh, for OA and, and you know their the the engineering talent at, at Sushi Swap we were, we were really impressed by and we thought that the the breadth of things that they were trying to accomplish could lead to some pretty powerful synergies especially you know setting up for the next bull market basically if you look at traditional brokerages and traditional exchanges or you know places where you buy and sell crypto right now I, I like to say traditional it's funny that I say that but like places like Coinbase and places like FTX and places you know, like Falcon X and Genesis. And what are they always, what are they always doing? Well, at some point they stop competing on price. Hmm. They're no longer competing on price. What they're competing on are all the auxiliary services that they provide you. Are they giving you margin? Are they, you know, leverage? Are they giving you research? Are they giving you like, what, what else are they giving you to get you in the door? And I think that's where Sushi has a tremendous amount of edge is, to build out a product suite that isn't just an exchange, right? And to basically be the place that people come to when they need to access the crypto markets in the future, right? That's gonna take a lot of work. There's a lot of work that goes into this before then, but we're confident that the, there's dedication here, that there's talent here. And now with the new CEO, there's leadership. And we're here to re really, we're just here to cheer them on from the sidelines. You know, one thing that I'll emphasize is that we, we you know, we publicly announced it. We bought a position in Sushi Swap. I like Sushi Swap. I'm not trying to tell Sushi Swap what to do. We're just here to give our ideas. You know, we, we you know we we've been around the block. We think we can be helpful. We have a good relationship with the team. Uh, I'm just here to provide ideas. So, like, if you look at our proposal, it wasn't actually you know, or sorry, our post. It wasn't a proposal. It was just a post. Mm -hmm. It was, hey, here are all of these things that we could do. Why don't we talk about it? And then, you know, we, we propose so many different things. Uh, you know, I, we've got some ideas of what the highest priority is, but I'm not here to force anything down anybody's throat. I'm, I'm here to hear out what the community has to say and, and make sure that, you know, our ideas are not just us telling people what to do, but are debated, discussed. If they're bad, we're told they're bad. If they're good, we're told they're good. Uh, and then, you know, as a community, we can move forward and actually figure out what the, what the best path forward is. I'm actually really curious how this differs from a traditional kind of corporate takeover or restructuring process, because with like with these decentralized networks, obviously you can't come in and take a majority share because everyone will say, wow, it's VC owned, it's just owned by one person. So you get to preserve that decentralization. And at the same time, you got to contend with every single one, every single person who holds like $2 of sushi is going to have a say on the forum as well. So how do you filter through all that noise? How do you push things through without compromising on um, without some of those tools that you would have at your disposal in a traditional takeover, stay tuned. <laughs> I think uh, I, I, you know, it's 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 definitely it's definitely a an exercise in consensus building mm. more than it is anything else. Uh, you know, it's it's and and it's also making sure that you understand where everybody's coming from. It's a lot more fucking difficult. Excuse my French. <laughs> than a traditional restructure because in a traditional restructure you can just come in and you can say, guess what, like. We're firing all of you and we're just gonna you know it's like what are you, like okay well how can you fire somebody that isn't is not hired <laughs> <laughs> right like you know you, you can't there's no there's no legal structure to say we are now the owners of this thing we're the owners of its assets we're the owners of its ip we're the owners of it. it's like you can't do that in crypto as really so you know it's it's uh that you know i think um let me let, let me let me let me put it let me put it like this if you could, it would it would kind of be chaos because there are a lot of turnarounds with good assets out there. Mm. So you, you you'd probably see a lot of VCs try to do that, but you can't. So you know, um, 
it's actually probably a good thing uh, for crypto, uh, at least for the founders. Um, so it's it's one of those things where uh, it's it's really just you know we 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 establish this position because we have faith in the community. Um, you know we're not we're not here to try to force anything out, right? Because we can't. So the the idea the idea in a in a restructuring in crypto is really twofold. It's good relationships with the key people on the team that are developed because you're just genuinely helpful and you genuinely care. Right. I think if, if, if you, if you, you know, if you, if you come in and you're just like, Hey, I'm just here to extract value. Well, that doesn't make sense. And that's why we're doing this with sushi. We're not doing this with anything else because you know, we, we all have history with sushi. So it's like, we, we actually want this thing to succeed. Um, if you look at, you know, so it's good. It's good. It's good relationships. You, you, you need that. And then it's consensus building with, you know, the, the large, the large holders and the small holders. Right. And it's, it's really debating and being open and taking the time to go, taking the time to go do that. I think, you know, one, one difference in, in crypto, uh, than, than, than traditional is that crypto is a small world, hmm. which means that if you, you know, if you do this, everybody notices, everybody pays attention and everybody cares. It's the best marketing campaign I ever could have run for this thing. Right. So like yeah, on, on, well. one, on one hand, it's harder. On the other hand, there's actually, you know, there, 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 there's some benefits too. Hmm. I really like that tag. And I, I remember there were, um, you know, a few attempts at different activist campaigns before, you know, I, I think Arco was pushing the Gnosis uh, campaign just a few years ago, which, which I thought was a really interesting case study. And I actually thought of like doing something in that arena, maybe starting some sort of an activist DAO, but I just thought, okay, maybe it's a bit too early for this, for the market, but to see you guys come in and do this um, in, in, in a way that doesn't impose yourself onto the project, but kind of attach yourself to the project as a resource. I think that's probably the right way to do it. And I, I guess it makes sense why Golden Tree has been one of the kind of best restructurers out there. Um, but I think in terms of time, that, that's pretty much all the time we have. I'm really glad we got to cover all of this and really glad we got to do this. But I feel like there's a lot more that we could discuss. So maybe we'll do a part two down the road. But um, for those who want to follow you and follow what's going on with Sushi or what you guys are doing on Sushi, um, what should they do? Like, where should they go? Yeah, just you can just follow me on Twitter. I'm at Avi Fellman. Pretty, pretty simple, straightforward. I tweet out all of our proposals. So, Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for doing this again. This has been a long time coming, man. No, I appreciate it, Jason. All right, that's it for this week's episode of the Blockrange Podcast. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe on your favorite apps. And in case you didn't know, this interview is also available as a video on YouTube. And if you tag the Blockrange on Twitter this week and tell us what you liked about this episode, I'll be sure to respond to you as well. Now, if you'd like to go even deeper, we have a VIP tier where every week or so, we write an in-depth research brief or investment memo on a project. And we'll have exclusive AMAs with myself where I answer all your questions as well. Now, we already have analysts from some of the top funds and companies in crypto as subscribers. So if you're serious about getting an edge in crypto, head on over to theblockcrunch.com slash VIP to learn more. And once again, thanks for supporting the show and I'll see you next week.